So welcome back to part two, episode two of our justice series, Justice for Victims of Sex Trafficking. We are interviewing Corey Nichols from Destiny Rescue for the second time, the second week in a row. Corey is a wealth of information, knowledge, passion, fire, inspiration, and uh, we thought it was worth it to have him on twice. Uh, the first guest we've ever had on two times in a row. <laughs> I feel honored, extremely honored. <laughs> Don't. It's a short-lived podcast, very small history of this podcast, so uh, <laughs> it doesn't say much. But <laughs> now it's great to have you, Corey. Um, Tom will just facilitate uh, as usual, and uh, I'll hand it off to him now. All right. Thank you, Chris. And again, thanks to you again, Corey, for joining us for another week. I think you know, last week was very impactful for me personally, and hopefully for any of those watching. And we didn't, it was, we had so much to talk about. We didn't get to it all last week. So uh, we do want to address a few things. And the first uh, area I wanted to address with you and, and with anyone watching is the idea that this is happening somewhere else. This may not be on your doorstep. It's happening somewhere else. So we don't really have to face it. And you had um, said something, you know, last week that I wanted to touch on. You, you or your examples were from over in Asia, but it's not something we can think is just confined to that area. You said this is happening in every country, you know, every state, you know, all, all over the place. This is, you know, this uh, exploitation uh, of kids, sex trafficking is happening everywhere. Is that an accurate uh, summary of, of your statements from last week? It absolutely is. It's, it's definitely something that affects every single country in the world. And to your point, all 50 states, there's cases in all 50 states. And it's probably in your city happening right under your noses. And a lot of times you don't even know what to look out for. And so my heart is to encourage people to get educated on the issue in your own local community, not just what's happening globally. Um, our, our expertise is what's happening internationally, but I do know things that are happening here in the United States. The number one at risk person in the United States is the foster care child. You're dealing with instability and breakdown of families and that can happen through a number of different things. It could mean their parents are incarcerated. It could mean that the parents are addicted to drugs and the state has deemed that it's not a safe environment for that child to be in that state, in that family so they get put into the foster care system and they feel a child can feel unloved or un, unwanted whether that's the parents doing that on purpose or they just are struggling with a lot of different things a child feels abandoned or not getting the care they need and so they start looking for love in all the wrong places and traffickers know that and they groom them pretending to be a boyfriend or something like that and it's very easy to begin grooming coercing tricking or forcing a child into slavery and so but it can happen to anyone it's not just a foster care child it can literally happen to anyone if you're in put in a, a difficult situation and so thanks for clarifying that and just to touch upon that, you know, I think to, to help shed some light on it, I'm going to share my screen in a second just to go over uh, really how close to home uh, this, this hits. So if you could, I'm just going to share this with you. All right. And so this is, oops, sorry, definitely hit the wrong thing there. There we go. So this is basically a chart from back in 2017 of where victims of human trafficking came from of those who were recovered in the United States. For, so for all the ones that we found in the U.S., what was their country of origin? And you see that biggest slice of the pie there, the far majority of it is native people from the United States. There's a mixture of people from other countries, but the vast majority uh, of trafficking is national or regional, and it's carried out by people with the same nationality as their victims. So this is something that hits close to home. And if you think it's, you know, maybe part, in parts of our country, but not other parts, as Corey was saying, that's not true. It is in every state. And for those of us who would like to think New Jersey is immune, this is from the Department of Justice website from two weeks ago. 
a case they busted on a New Jersey man transporting women to Virginia for prostitution. So this happens in every country, every state, even our state. So it's, uh, it's something that's, that's close, close to home for us. And, um, and I think to your, to your point that you were just making, uh, you know, as far as the, the victims go, um, the, the numbers certainly bear out what you were talking about. And I think we touched on this last week, how the, of the child victims that they recover from sex trafficking, 60% of them were from foster care. So they are extremely, extremely high risk. But yeah, the, the, it was shocking to me because I think of this more as an international problem. It was shocking to me to find out that most of the victims come right here from the, uh, right from the USA who are being trafficked here and mostly being trafficked by uh, other Americans and that this is the case worldwide, mostly within their own country. And so, Corey, do you run into that? Basically, most of the victims that you're rescuing are you know, somewhat locals? Yeah, I would say the majority of those that we rescue are from their own country. Or I, I say that, but again, we're rescuing a lot of victims on the Nepali border. We have border crossing stations on the Nepali border. And what, what's so interesting about that specific country is 30% of the workforce in that country has to look for work outside of the country because there's just not enough jobs in their country. Um, it's a vast majority of that country has limited resources because of the mountains. It's the Himalayas. So they're looking for work in another country like India and it's an open border. And so traffickers are luring victims, promising them work. And with little understanding of that job, they're believing the best because they're extremely impoverished looking for hope. But I would say the vast majority outside of that specific situation, the majority of those that we rescue are from their native country. Um, not exclusively, but they are from their native country and being trafficked in their country. Yeah, that's... It's, I mean, it's good to really clear that up because, you know, I think a lot of people might think this of this as a faraway problem when in fact it's not. Yeah. So uh, another thing that you had actually brought up and, and thank you for doing so was sort of uh, the grooming uh, and the sort of the recruitment uh, of these kids and how they get them into those situations. And we talked about a few different ones that you encountered in the field last week, but one that we did not get to touch upon was the use of social media as a platform to groom and recruit victims for sex trafficking. Uh, so do, have you found that to be a pervasive means uh, by which this is carried out? And could you comment a bit about how that is used? Absolutely. Traffickers will use any means they can to manipulate, coerce, or trick their victim, their vulnerable victim, into slavery and take advantage of them. So trafficking is built on greed and lust. And so there's a demand there's a demand for it, and there's a greed element that they can make money off somebody they can exploit. And social media, if they can find ways to build the trust of their victim, they will do that. And so social media has proven to be a great grooming ground for traffickers. Um, it's sad, but they, build, they literally build the trust of a naive young person. And so parents, I want to caution you understand what your children are doing on their devices. Understand the types of apps and social media platforms they're using and have an eye on it because traffickers, pedophiles, people willing to exploit and take an advantage of a child is happening literally every single day and they create false alias names and they pretend to be another child and they try to build the trust of that child and they might say something like they love hey i think you're beautiful like and they just start there getting information and how they can maybe do a meetup or maybe have that young person expose themselves online and now all of a sudden they got pictures and stuff and they they can start manipulating them um and so what I want to encourage is that parents create a safe environment for your, young, your children to be able to be open and honest with what's happened to them. If you try to shame them or get 
really like stir many times they, they'll have a hard time opening up to you and i'm not saying that don't be there's no parental discipline but create a safe environment because many times they're being exploited and taken advantage of and they need a safe place they can truly open up to um, and i would say to young people find a trusted adult you can share what's happening to you online don't keep it in the dark traffickers and pedophiles those willing to exploit you and take advantage of you want you to keep the information in the dark this is between us this is our secret don't tell your parents don't touch tell a guardian this is between us they won't understand and that's how they do it and then they want to then potentially they want to do a meetup or they just may try to take advantage you of you online and take those images and sell it across the internet um, and exploit you so tell somebody young person have the courage to bring it into the light because where things come into the light there's safety and there's the opportunity to deal with something my niece was just given the privilege at 13 years old to be on instagram that my the, my my sister and brother-in-law set up all the right parental protections and lo and behold a 53 year old man private messenger broke through all of the things and started private messaging my niece at 13 years old she had the courage and the audacity to bring it up to her mom and her mom was like oh my gosh this is crazy and they were able to help coach and encourage her but and help her understand the dangers of social media so understand that people willing to exploit they find ways to get through parental protective guidance and stuff and you have to be up to speed on what's happening on social media i there's another girl that um my she was involved in this youth group that my that my my parents my my dad said mom they passed her to church and this girl she was in the youth group and she came from a broken family her parents had been divorced and her dad remarried but then her dad divorced her stepmom who she knew as a mom growing up she was broken and lo and behold she meets a man on a gaming device in a chat room on a gaming device and he started grooming her and told her that she loved her you couldn't speak to her about any common sense after that because she said she thought she was so in love with this person that loved her her aunt contacted me knowing i was working for an anti-trafficking organization and said can you please speak into this girl she's now 18 years old we can't force her to do anything we found out this man lives in Canada. He has, we talked with the police and the police said he has, he has some criminal record and is not allowed to leave the country. And they did some investigative work and everything he said that he was involved in and work never panned out. And he couldn't find any information on social media, but he wanted her to come meet him in Canada. And the police said, we can't tell you what he's done but we would highly recommend that she not have anything to do with this man and so long story short i believe we were able to convince her or i wasn't but her aunt was able to convince her this was a poor decision but literally that's what traffickers do they prey on the vulnerability of these kids that are wanting and starving for love and affection and they groom them to a meetup and then they take advantage of that situation. So another couple, I speak all the time around the country and I had many opportunities to speak to young people. And I spoke, was speaking at this youth group and this one young boy, he was 14 years old. He was like, oh, oh, I had just got done giving a presentation about the dangers of social media. And he said, my friend and I, we were at my house and we were on the Xbox and I had my username up there. We were playing and this guy kept pressuring me to become friends with him on my gaming device on the Xbox. And so he kept saying, no, no, no. And then eventually he's like, what's the harm? And so he said, yes. 
Well, all his contact information was available, including his address on his username. And within a couple minutes, that man was at his doorstep, at his doorstep, and one of their fathers was at the home and said, hey, to that man that came up to the door, and he took off running. Oh my and, um, and so I just can't over underestimate, overestimate, whatever. I can't emphasize enough. Be involved in your kids' lives. Be involved. Have an understanding of what they're doing on their phones because these devices have so much exposure to the world that if you're not monitoring it, they can have access or people can get into their world and begin to manipulate and coerce them. Wow. So yeah, so just to highlight it to parents, it's not even just the social media apps, the well-known apps. It's really any online forum where people can interact, be it gaming, gaming forums, you know, what what have you. So uh, you know, the predators are out there looking to attack not just through, you know, Facebook or, or things of the like, but really things that seem innocent, like you know, like simple online games where they're really at risk. Mm. So to just give you like a real trafficking situation that uses social media. This girl, she was 19 years old. She met a boy who was 22 years old. So a young man, 22 years old online. And they became friends on Facebook and they started chatting. And in their conversation about chatting, she ended up saying, I'm looking for a job. And so he said, hey, I have a job you would love it's in a neighboring country. I'm actually from your country, Nepal, and I can get you a job that where you can make more money than your dad makes in an entire year. I want to help you. In fact, I can, you can stay with my brother and his wife in their house so you can save rent on money and, and I really want to help you. And so, all of a sudden she began to think, oh my gosh, our family needs money. I, need, I, I think this could be a great opportunity. He had built trust with her and she said yes. So he came into her country, into her hometown village and met up with her, got two bus tickets and they started moving towards the border. And our border crossing station agents stopped the bus, got on the bus and started looking at all the people on the bus. And they started asking questions to everybody on the bus and they came up to Samita and this young man who were traveling together. And they started asking them questions and their questions did not seem to measure up. So they started asking more questions. And eventually they separated the parties, Samita and this young man, and they started asking more questions and they didn't believe their story. So they, the agent said, let me call your parents, speaking of the young woman. So she calls, they call the phone number that she said were her parents, but it was actually the young man's brother and sister-in-law, and none of their stories started adding up. So she said, well, my father passed away, and I don't have a good relationship with my family anymore. And so she lied again because he told her to lie about everything. And so she was lying, but they found out our agents are very good at finding out information and they found out the village she was from. So they contacted the chief in that village and they found out she did have parents. They contacted the parents and the parents said, oh my gosh, no, we did not know that our daughter was at the border. Do not let her cross that border. And come to find out she was being trafficked this guy was desperate for money and he was going to sell her into a brothel. And all it took was developing a relationship online and, and getting enough information that dealt with her vulnerable situation. And he groomed her, built trust, and was trying to traffic her across that border to where she would never see the light of day again. So, so Corey, if I'm understanding this correctly, how this sometimes works, it's not just a... So, so girls are, are predominantly the ones being trafficked over boys. However, 
a young boy will be exploited if he needs cash, if he needs money, if his family's struggling, he will be exploited for that and say, hey, well, we can use you. You get us this girl, you, and, and yep. know what, train him and how to groom her? Yep. So it's not necessarily a 53-year-old creepy guy. It could be a 22-year-old no. good-looking kid, looks like the boy next door, who's doing the grooming. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and he's exploited as well. Yep, absolutely. It's a massive money maker. There's a whole network of these people that are looking for kids. And, you know, it is, a, it is a big issue in the United States, but it is a massive issue around the world, especially in the developing world where they're preying on poverty yeah. and the vulnerability of these desperate families that are looking for work. So you know, I get a lot of different scenarios, both here in the United States and abroad, and kind of how they, they can use social media or online platforms to really groom and take advantage of their victim. And so Corey, just a, a side question off that. Is, the, is there sort of, an, you know, for lack of better terms, uh, sort of a corporate structure to this, basically like different positions that, that get developed for the purpose of trafficking? Like, do they, do they have like full-time like recruiters or point men, people who, whether they're exploited or just, or just hired, they go out there to be maybe the young guy, you know, the young, good looking guy who can snare girls more easily. Is he basically, you know, sent out there to get one, come back, you know, drop her off, go out and get another one. Is that some sort of like basically their job position or is it just the recruiter or sorry, the trafficker just snatches them any way they can. And, you know, sometimes it's online and sometimes it's through exploiting, you know, families, what have you. It's my understanding, and I, I wouldn't say this is the only way, but it is definitely a way where there are recruiters. They're, they're looking to groom and take advantage of those kids, and they bring them to a brothel. They, they actually will bring them to a breaking room in some situations. They'll take them to a house once they cross that border, and the goal is to break them from fighting back. And where they settle in their heart that this is the rest going to be the rest of my life, and I can't fight back then they sell them into a brothel to a brothel owner who will give them a lot of money for that child. And then that brothel pays customers to come in and take advantage of that girl and use her over and over and over and over and over again. So there's a, a interesting point you want to bring up that I'd like to clarify this concept of the breaking room, sort of breaking their spirit against resistance. Do you have a, uh, any firsthand accounts of what actually goes on in those situations, things that you could share with us of how they accomplish that, what they do to these girls? Yep. So um, I, I actually was in a horrific brothel and this woman had just gotten back from a torture room because she was non-compliant. They beat her and she was all cry in the face. And, you know, several of the women, at least two, maybe three of the women, um, the brothel owner said, or maybe not the brothel owner, our rescue agent who was working in that brothel said that several of these women had AIDS and they were still being forced to service customers with AIDS. And so the, the, the brothel, they, they don't care. You, you are their property to, to do whatever they want so that they can gain money. And this same brothel owner, he said this to me, I treat these women so well. I treat these women with great dignity. And like, and I was thinking, you treat them well, they're slaves. Like it was the most horrible environment. And not all of them are in a similar situation. Some of them, they actually have the freedom to leave. They, they have the freedom to leave like a bar or a brothel. They're not literally like chained down. Like a lot of people think of taken or something like that. They actually, have the freedom to leave the brothel, but they feel the pressure from helping their family survive. And the trafficker pressures them into doing horrible things with customers they don't want to do and says, if you don't do this, you won't get paid and you won't send money home to your family. And because of the shame and that they experience that if it would ever get out to what, what they've been succumb, they've succumbed to in these environments, it could bring shame to their family. And so they keep quiet. Um, and it's just, it, there's a lot of different scenarios of how it works, but the, ultimately they're taking advantage of a girl's situation and coercing or pressuring her or forcing her 
to be in that environment. And a lot of times what traffickers do is they manipulate that person to enslave them. It's not holding them in chains, but it's psychologically controlling them that if you don't do what I say, I'll starve you. I'll beat you. I'll, I'll find your family and harm your family. So they, they make them compliant and um, it's just tragic. It's tragic. So our heart as Destiny Rescue, let's flip it really quickly, is to ensure justice for these kids. That somebody is on the front lines willing to find them and rescue them. One story, this beautiful girl, she was a worship leader at her church. She was a Sunday school teacher at her church. And her dad got sick and um, could no longer work or got hurt, could no longer work. And she felt the mounting pressure to help her family survive. And she went out looking for work and she was easily coerced and pressured into the sex industry. And our agents, one of our agents went into this brothel. It was like a beer garden. And she had been crying out to God, God, save me, deliver me. I'm your child, send an angel. And a couple weeks later, one of our agents shows up and he sits with her and he, he's in a band. He actually is a drummer in a band. And he said to her, what kind of music are you into? And she said, I'm into church music. And he's like, what? Like, I'm really intrigued. Like people don't, girls don't say that. So, and she began to share the horrible downward spiral of what she went through and what she endured and that she had been crying out to God for God to send an angel. And he said, he broke his cover and he said, I'm here to answer that prayer that you prayed. I want to help deliver you out of this situation. This is the organization that I work with and I'm here to rescue you. And she said, this is what she said. This was the haunting thing that she said. Why did it take you four months to get to me? Wow. Why did it take you four months to get to me when I was crying out for help? Today, that beautiful girl wow. has gone on to, she's in college, getting a college education. She's working in a call center and she's back leading worship and teaching Sunday school at her church. Wow. Why? Because people caught the vision of God's heart for justice and they were willing to play their part so that Destiny Rescue can respond on the front lines to see kids rescued. Corey, Amen. can I ask what country that was in? The Philippines. Hmm. Wow. And Corey, you bring up a great point about really, really this being a heart issue um, uh, as well. Um, not just that it weighs heavily uh, on, on our hearts, but the need to reach the hearts of those perpetuating this or allowing their family members to be caught up in this, um, to need to reach their hearts. You know, not just the very important, uh, very noble act of rescuing these girls out of these situations, but reaching the hearts of those who are perpetuating these situations uh, to get them out of it entirely, to basically stop the flow of the problem at its, at its source. How important is it to reach the hearts of traffickers, people who we may not want to have any sympathy for necessarily based on what they do, but God has plans for them. So how important is it for you to make efforts to reach the hearts of the people carrying out these horrific acts to, to turn their lives from this way and get them to stop, stop this at its source? Well, I, after living on like overseas in Asia and seeing the most unthinkable of evil and traveling to many different countries, seeing some of the darkest parts of humanity, I am absolutely convinced the answer is Jesus. He changes the human heart. He comes in and empowers people to live above the flesh and the sinful nature that exists in all of us. It exists in all of us. And I like to tell people, it is by the grace of God 
you've not gone down one of these crazy paths. Or maybe you're listening to this and you have. Maybe you've been a part of the problem. And I want you to know that in Christ, you can be forgiven and you can be part of the solution. Um, and so I really believe that Jesus is the answer. And you say, well, that's just a one's like just a crazy blanket statement. But I love this story in the Bible. Jesus went and met one woman. He said, I must go through Samaria. He said he must. And he went and he met with this woman at the well. And God was, Jesus was getting to the root of her issue. She was looking to find fulfillment in men. And when one didn't work, she cast them aside and went to the next one. And then the next one. And then the next one. And she had married five men and was living with a sixth man that wasn't her husband. And Jesus was saying, you're looking to try to find fulfillment in something other than what I created and designed you to find ultimate fulfillment, complete satisfaction. And he was saying, I am the living water you're looking for. And that if you drink from me, you won't thirst again. In other words, if you place me at the center of your life, I'll help the rest of your life begin to make sense. And I'll help you begin to overcome everything else in your life. And, and so I believe Jesus is, is at the center. And so you, you talk about what, what can we do to help people that are perpetuating this issue? I, I believe the church needs to be part of the solution to this. We, we are to help people. Um, Jesus said he looked over at the multitude and he had compassion and that he came to seek and save that which was lost and the sick, those that were especially wicked sinners, so to speak. And so creating an environment where people can be open and honest with their struggle and not shamed. When you try to beat people up into um, getting better, Chris, you're a pastor, does that work? Like when you shame people into, what, what are your thoughts? Do you feel that works in, in the things that you've learned like <laughs> yeah maybe for a few days but uh yeah all that all that does is breed isolation secrets more secrecy which yes more weakness and then uh and then the, the addiction continues so yeah so creating a safe environment for people to be real a path to redemption um i'm not saying there's not consequences to choices we make um you know if you're a trafficker you should face the full justice of the law like like and and deal with the consequences of you taking advantage of somebody but there needs to be a path to redemption whether that's serving jail time and somebody meets with you in jail or in in the church environment that it's not as severe it's like struggling with pornography or or a, a sexual addiction that you need you need help you need somebody to help walk with you and provide a path to recovery and and I believe that as we, as the body of Christ, produce the truths that are illuminated in scripture and point people to Christ and understanding their value and worth and their identity in him, he can help you begin to overcome these strongholds in their hearts and, and begin to help make um, a difference. Yeah. So Corey, do you have uh, any examples that you can share of an instance where this really played out in real life where God touched the heart of someone involved in the trade and how that, you know, drastically affected them going forward and uh, helped the problem uh, at its source. Uh, any, Absolutely. Any examples? Absolutely. So one girl in particular, um, I don't want to name names uh, sure. on this one, but one girl that we helped rescue her mother sold her into a, uh, a brothel and her daughter basically said, I don't want to do this. And she basically said, you're going to stay there and work and earn money for me. She felt extremely angry when we rescued her. She was angry. She was hopeless. She, she didn't trust. And we helped introduce her to Jesus. And we helped her overcome those anger issues. And she began to learn to forgive through Christ and understanding what Christ did for her. And that hardened heart because of the trauma she endured. Christ came in and began to heal those areas and she forgave her mother. 
She forgave her mother. She went back and witnessed to her mother and her mother gave her life to Christ. And that whole family dynamic is completely different today wow. because of what Jesus has done. Wow. What happened to the mother? So th they're in relationship today. Wow. I don't want to get into all the details of that, but um, yeah. they, they are in, and this, this girl um, is thriving in life and she wants to be a missionary. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's an amazing testament to the power of God to turn a situation from horrific now, uh, you know, back to, to glory. So that's, that's outstanding. Yeah. And you had, uh, you had mentioned if you, if you could uh, sharing the story of the, the brothel owner who um, was eventually saved and then gave her brothel over to being a church. Yep. So this is a powerful story. Uh, and again, I'm not going to mention this country, but the rescue agent had been working a case and they rescued a, a girl and the brothel owner was trafficking this girl. And this rescue agent is also a pastor and he cared for this brothel owner um, that she would give her life to Christ. And so she faced the full letter of the law and she had to go to prison and jail, but he led her to Christ and she became a Christian and she had this brothel. So she said, what should I do with this brothel? And um, she said, I'm going to give it to you to have as a church building. And so now um, our rescue agent, who's also a pastor, is leading people to Christ in the most dark environment that sometimes our brain can't even comprehend the kind of darkness that he's surrounded by and that he deals with. But Jesus is in the midst of darkness. He came into our dark, corrupt world to save us. And we are to be those kind of lights in dark places. And so I just, there's so many amazing testimonies of kids coming to Christ, of their families coming to Christ, um, of a lot of real brokenness. And, um, and through that, just their lives being radically changed for the better. Wow. Uh, it's amazing. That's amazing. Not only a brothel being wow. shut down, but then being, being transformed in, 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 <laughs> into a place for, for God's work to be done wow. it is really an amazing testimony to um, his ability to use any situation, uh, really any situation, no matter how dire uh, or dark. Uh, that's, that's really incredible. And I think it's also that story, a great testimony to both the power, the justice and the grace uh, of God. Cause you know, you think, with this topic, particularly, a lot of us really want to seek justice and justice on really any uh, any terms. And and this is a case where justice was sought. You know, the the per person had to pay for for what they did, but also that the pastor cared enough for them to invest in their lives, turn them around. So not only did someone just go to jail, but her life was forever changed, and now she's allowing a facility where others' lives will be changed. It's, Amen. It's really quite incredible. Yeah, Corey, I would imagine that for the traffickers, for brothel owners, for people who perpetuate this, who knowingly perpetuate trafficking in some, you know, in some part of that network, I would imagine that a lot of them have to at least, at least some of them have to be motivated by the need to provide for their own families. Am I, am I correct? Sometimes I think, what would it take for me to do something so depraved? And it's like, first of all, no, no God to trust in and provide for me. And then secondly, I'm like, if I see my girls starving, if I see my three little girls starving, I would imagine it would drive me to do something desperate. Am I, am I correct in that? You are. I mean, uh, you are correct. And a lot of these brothel managers, they might not be the owner, but they're managers. They were once girls servicing customers and they've kind of outgrown that, but there, there's no other, they don't feel they have any other skill sets. They don't, and it's just a slippery slope. And now you're, you're the one recruiting girls, telling them what they should do to customers. And, you know, your heart has been so jaded and broken and hardened over the years. Now you think nothing twice about selling a child or um, a young, young adult in, in, into horrible situations. I mean, I, I've been, I've been 
under doing undercover work and sat in so many beer gardens or brothels and these brothel managers these women maybe even owners they won't think twice about selling a child it's like as quick as picking toppings on a pizza they're just like you you need to go with this man and um you can just see the horror and terror on these girls faces and yet they have to put on a show like they're smiling but if you can catch them when no one's looking they're just they feel hopeless they're they're just and so anyways wow goodness <sighs> that is that's tough stuff all right everyone well we are interrupting this episode and we are going to break it up into two so we're gonna uh it, it was a lot there's a lot of content and instead of having a very long part two we're gonna have a part two and then a part three next week so um uh, tune in next week we're gonna release part three which is the rest of this second interview with Corey nichols uh we're gonna talk more about the source of uh this problem lust and and what um, many of us do to perpetuate the demand for sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. We're going to talk about solutions, practical solutions, how you and I can be involved in this fight. So uh, again, watch next week. And then we also have three other justice topics that we're going to be diving into on future podcasts. Uh, justice for the hungry, justice for the foreigner, and justice for the fatherless. Um, as Tom and I plan for those podcast interviews, if you know of somebody who you would uh, deem somewhat of an expert in a field that uh, is is on the front lines uh, with any of those issues, um, would you let us know? That's how we found Corey Nichols. Rob Allen said, hey, if you don't have anybody for human trafficking yet, you might want to check out this guy in this organization. So uh, if you have someone that you know of, would you let Tom or I know? Okay, everyone, let's be praying for the victims of sex trafficking.